Welcome to IISS Americas uh, for today's book launch discussion on China's digital Silk Road, uh, China's technological rise and the geopolitics of cyberspace. My name is Hao Yutong, a researcher for the Geoeconomics and Strategy Program. Uh, for today's discussion, we have a truly wonderful panel. Uh, we have the two in-house experts who are also the editors for this book, uh, Dr. David Gordon, Senior Advisor for Geoeconomics and Strategy Program, uh, we have Maya Nowens, uh, just arrived from Blendon, Senior Fellow for Chinese Defense, Policy and Military Modernization. Uh, we're also very pleased to have two uh, leading experts and key contributors to this book. Uh, Paul Triolo, Senior Fel uh, senior Vice President for China and Technology Policy Lead at the Albright Stonebridge Group. And we have Scott Malcolmson, uh, Principal at the Strategic Insight Group. Scott is also the author of the book, um, which is uh, uh, The Splinternet, How Geopolitics and Commerce Are Fragmenting the World Wide Web. And so uh, as a newest addition to the, the double IWS Adelphi series, I think, I think this book offers one of the most comprehensive analyses on China's digital and technological presence in the world. Um, but I think, China's technological rise was never a given, right? Um, as a nation state, China has long been this technological backwater. Uh, just 15 years ago, I think the, no the notion of the, the idea that you could order something, make an online payment, order something, and you'd be able to fully trust someone, perhaps on the other side of the country, to send you what you have ordered is, is a radical notion. So from that as a starting point, I, th I think, the expansion and growth of China's uh, consumer technology companies uh, is a stunning success. Uh, but China still relies a lot on foreign input uh, for its, uh, for its technol uh, technological industry. Uh, in 2020, the, sp uh, the country spent uh, more money uh, to import chips than oil. And in 2020, uh, in 2021, uh, China's import expenditure on chips on semiconductor has uh, gone beyond 16%. And as Scott has argued in his chapter, uh, there's increasingly a need to balance prosperity and, uh, and security when it comes to technology. As China resorted to industrial policies and protectionisms to catch up uh, on the part of the US, um, uh, the US we're seeing uh, this renewed emphasis on the export control regime, which was originally conceived to control the spread of uh, weapons of mass destruction uh, to, to ensure its lead over uh, competitors. Uh, so there's a lot that we hope to unpack today. Um, and I'd like to divide today's discussion into four parts, uh, each inspired by a theme covered in this publication. Uh, the first part will be about more about the definitional questions, such as what is the DSR and its relationship with the BRI. Second part would be the relationship between Chinese tech companies and the state uh, in Beijing. The third part would be about questions related to uh, DSR recipient countries. <clears throat> and finally, we'd, we'd also like to talk a little bit about the geopolitics of technology. Um, regarding the format, we'd like to keep the format a little bit more fluid for this discussion. So as I throw out perhaps one or two uh, kickoff questions to the panelists, please feel free to raise your hand if you're joining us uh, in person today or Please submit your questions in the chat box if you're joining us online. We have well over 100 participants uh, online today. So uh, let's see how that goes. Um, so if I may, I'd like to perhaps ask the panelists, um, what is the role of technology overall in the Chinese leadership's uh, overall national ambition and strategy? Um, Who would you like to go for? Maybe David as, First, as the uh, editor, uh, one of the editors. <laughs> we'll start with the in-house and then the outhouse. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much, Hayu. And uh, thanks all of you for coming. Welcome to those of you who joined online. Uh, so so uh, I do think that, that, that China uh, puts an enormous amount of effort on 
technology and actually has for for a very long time so this is so i do think china's notion of progress uh is um the 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 element of technology and technological development is deeply embedded within that and of course you know china technology technologically from a, a, a large civilizational perspective china has been a technological leader during uh much uh, of the millennia now that that was broken by the so-called hundred years of humiliation uh, uh and china's very much oriented now towards catching up uh but i i do think that that china's notion of national power uh that that technology has a critical place in that uh part of that notion of national power and the and and the role of technology is military uh but a lot of it is not military uh and and so i do think that 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 um china's technological rise is something that that's really important to to beijing but beijing government doesn't control it that the, that the main elements uh of china's technological development many of those main elements lie elsewhere they they lie in the educational sphere they lie especially in the commercial sphere uh and and I think one of the main themes here uh in looking at the digital silk road is this question of the relationship between companies and the state uh so China has 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 wanted to develop technological companies on the one hand on the other hand has been worried about technological companies uh in uh drifting into spheres that that the government sees as the role of the state and that's famously captured by the the now long-standing saga uh of jack ma and alibaba uh and, but that's only the most prominent example but let me that's just a way to set the stage i'm, I'm really interested in what others have to say uh paul please yeah thanks uh, you and david great comments um yeah we can go about how far back do we want to go right to the one bomb <laughs> right one missile two bombs um, I think the challenge in, say, the, in the Xi Jinping era is how does China's industrial policy sort of match up with the, the global reality in, in, in key technology sectors like semiconductors? So I think um, Xi Jinping, when he came into power, of course, he did a lot of different things. And one thing, he obviously understands technology and 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 focuses on it and has Politburo standing committee meetings focused on semiconductors and quantum and AI, right? So very, I, which I, I have a hard time imagining in the US, although recently that's been, that's been more prominent and with focus on, on really key areas. But um, but he, he he has this concept of um, of Wang Luqianguo, which is, you know, building China into a cyber power. And I always add on par with the US, that's sort of the overall strategy. But how do you do, how you do that is, you know, the details of course matter um, and so when he came into power, he set up the National IC Fund, um, which is sort of, uh, you know, the, their, one of their many attempts to, to, to jump start the semiconductor industry, which is now changing as a result of some of these recent developments, which we can talk about. Um, and then all these other things like, um, like BRI, DSR, and, um, and, and Made in China 2025, and uh, and mill steel fusion, those are all sort of parts of this, um, of this picture here. So untangling all this, I think, and um, and the role of BRI and DSR in this, I think, which which we tackled in the book, um, was an attempt to sort of say, hey, you know, how does how does how does how does the government role uh, fit here? Because this is unique in the sense that the, that the vast majority of the companies that are doing things on the DSR side more say than on the 
BRI side, are private sector tech companies, you know, Huawei, Alibaba, uh, Tencent, and um, along with other other some state players. But I think that's the that's the what we try to get our head around in, in the in the book and in different chapters is sort of how to think about those uh, those issues. Um, and now, of course, it's even more uh, critical because um, all some of those companies are under pressure from export controls like Huawei, and you know, can they build the infrastructure and in, in Africa and Latin America that uh, that we might consider part of, of uh, DSR, um, and then on the semiconductors uh, uh, in the semiconductor arena, really tricky issue. Um, we work with clients, for example, that are concerned, leading U.S. companies in some of these areas that are concerned that eventually you'll have these two different technology stacks, right, and, and including things like semiconductors, um, and and that U.S. companies will be um, uh, eventually designed out of the Chinese technology stack, which we're already seeing, of course, as a result of some of the recent developments. Um, and so that's another facet of this whole issue that we need, we probably should discuss more. Um, I don't know that we tackle a little bit, I think, in some of the chapters in the book, but that's that's a, a, a key concern of um, particularly U.S. companies that play key roles and have big markets um, in countries you might better that, are, that have signed on to BRI or DSR or part of that. So we're at a kind of critical point in understanding all these issues. Um, and I think the book is a great con contribution to that. Great. Thank you so much. I can just add one thing to these already really extensive and, and excellent answers. And again, echo my thanks for those in the room and joining us online today is that when we think about the digital silk road, again, this is a very nebulous term. So we'll, I'm sure, get into um, what this actually is at the end of the day and what you include in it and what you don't include in it. Because at the end of the day, what we're talking about here is this national drive for tech supremacy and, and technological ambition. But on the other hand, and, and moving from becoming a recipient of technologies to an innovator in technologies, not just at home, but globally speaking as well. So an externalization of this ambition um, across the world. And so how this plays out in different geographies, as Scott has written about excellently in his chapter, is a really interesting way to look at this, to try and understand whether this externalization of Chinese tech ambitions is being pushed by Beijing or is actually being pulled uh, by recipient countries um, out of China um, and where we uh, see differences in those two uh, factors and also of course how we respond to that um, uh, in terms of technological competition between the United States and its allies and China. Great. Thank you, mate. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just, I mean, we'll get into my chapter a bit later, but just specific to your question, I'd just add three points. Going back in history, just, you know, to reemphasize the, the point that, you know, the CCP has been looking at the example of the Soviet Union and um, and and see the collapse of the Soviet Union is linked to its failure to um, uh, this sort of digitize in the 1980s sense anyway. And uh, and I think that example still really is is in their in their minds. And then just two other points, since I do tend to look at this more from an economic and company point of view than from a sort of strictly strategic or political point of view. Um, you know, the, the, the CCP has two very big problems that really only have technological solutions, one of which is um, uh, the shrinking of its working age population and the other, which is environmental destruction, which is, of course, related to, to, to dependence on um, you know, resources from outside its territory. So in order to solve those problems, they really only have technological solutions. So I think sometimes these discussions really focus on um, sort of, you know, political power struggle. Um, uh, but a lot of, I think, probably more of the motivation within China is really towards, you know, uh, continuing the prosperity and even economic survival, given the, you know, the severe headwinds they face. Right. Right. What, what, what do you think is the, Scott, the, the prospect of um, relying more on technology instead of its investment in China to, to continue to pro propel high growth? Is, is that possible in your mind? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm actually having a little trouble following so the question. As, as China, as Beijing now, uh, the leadership sees technology as a solution for a lot of the headwinds that it faces in the long term, right? right. Uh, what's the, what, do you think a, a good chance there is for, for the leadership to, to use technology instead of its you know, conventional growth, growth means, such as ah, infrastructure right. and, and exports? And, right, right. Well, I mean, so... <laughs> So they're in a difficult position, right? Because because the so the, the the way initially that the PRC tended to develop tech sectors that were new was that they would essentially leave companies very free to compete, and they they would selectively subsidize for the internal market, so that you'd kind of create um, 
a kind of simulated free market environment, uh, the competition would be very, very fierce. Eventually, the, the subsidies would be withdrawn. You'd have a few dominant companies that would win. So that's the on the domestic side. Then they go outside the domestic market. The domestic market is basically protected, right? So then they go to wherever they can go, um, uh, wherever the competition allows them to go. Like in, for the purposes of our book, I focus a lot on Africa and Latin America and places that were essentially neglected by Western technology companies. So, so the situation now is that those companies like Huawei or ZTE or Hikvision or others that we talk about in the book, um, they're uh, sort of uh, ability to bring in enough revenue to finance um, R&D in order to improve their capacity, uh, which is what the government wants them to do. Their ability to do that is compromised by being excluded from foreign markets because they need those revenues in order to be able to grow and, and improve their products. And so, right. so that's a kind of a roundabout way of answering the question. I mean, the, what the state's doing now is it's it's um it's you know it's putting more people and and it's making more equity investments and so on. It's basically reasserting control over these companies now that they become successful. The degree to which that reassertion of state control leads to them gradually failing as companies is kind of the question That's for the, the immediate future. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Paul? Yeah, just on that, that general question, I think, um, you know, one of the things they're doing of many responses to these, these, these challenges is focusing on infrastructure. So this sort of new infrastructure initiative, which was launched in uh, 2020, 2021. So they're building these huge projects like the National Unified Computer com, uh, Computer Compute Power Network and the East, you know, the East Data West Compute Project, where they're um, investing heavily in data centers, um, both sort of and national high performance computing centers, some of which, most of which have been hit by the by the export controls. Um, uh, but I think that that's one of the ways that the, that, that the idea is, is, is sort of build build a much better sort of infrastructure for the future for things like industrial internet and um, and this idea of uh, sort of more digitized uh, industries, and so they want to build this infrastructure to support that. And so that's one of the one of the many responses that that um, that that's hap are happening internally domestically. And some of the companies we're talking about here will, will be big contributors to that too. But but absolutely, Scott's point on um, on how companies like Huawei, for, in particular, which went from a hundred and forty billion dollar company to a, a ninety billion dollar company overnight, um, <laughs> will will make up for that revenue is a, is a big challenge. Thank you. Um, questions, Mark. Uh, thanks. I I'm not sure I I could write down in one sentence what digital Silk Road means. <laughs> You've talked about obviously, and I'm just a little dull. But can you just can somebody crystallize what it means? Yeah, so it's a great question. You want to the question. So, so the, the question is, what exactly does the digital Silk Road mean? What is it? Uh, so it's a great question. So in, I think the way that we've thought about it is that to, to see it as the the sort of cyber and technological element of the broader belt and road initiative uh so it it is an it is an effort to develop technology technological capabilities uh uh largely outside of china but with the with the direct involvement of Chinese firms, uh, Chinese uh, advisors, uh, uh, the the integration uh, or the expansion of markets uh, for Chinese goods and and services. So we we see the the DSR a, as a a part and parcel of the Belt and Road Initiative, this larger effort by China uh, to become a, a major player uh, in international development activities through the provision of key infrastructural investments uh, outside of its borders. Now, 
there's a bias here. There's a bias here because right. the project that we've been involved in and the project within which this book was developed was a project on the Belt and Road Initiative. So right. I I don't want to overstate that because I think a lot of this is autonomous to to the companies themselves, and it's a, that that the that the that the digital goals of china's government are are not at all bounded by bri in, in any sense so so we we've the the pathway into this that 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 we've been focused on here at double i double s is looking at dsr as sort of the 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 digital cyber component of this larger belt and road I initiative which is not the only way to look at this right can i just add two things oh, oh, you, 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 no just just two things to sort of anecdotally to add to that one is just i guess it was about five years i was talking to kai fu lee whom i'm sure everybody here's heard of but um and uh and we were talking about this issue in, in his opinion the digital aspect of the Belt and Road was kind of an accident. And, and when you look at the sort of some of the, both the digital and especially the BRI documents, uh, of, you know, the official ones, it does kind of come in through the back door. I think it's it's reasonable to, to say. Other anecdote, just because when I was preparing my chapter, I read through, you know, a lot of company reports, annual reports of Chinese international companies, and uh, they would refer, you know, to um, somewhere between happy coincidence and intentionality <laughs> that that uh, what they were doing in building um, digital infrastructure in East East Africa, for example, was happily in tune with the political direction of the Belt and Road Initiative. So so it's the even the way China defines the digital Silk Road would be um, a little bit vague at times. Yeah, I would just add that um, it sort of I guess it also depends on where you sit, right? So I think. The China, as originally conceived, I, I think it was more the, the sort of in, the digital infrastructure to support the yeah. Belt and Road, the, the very specific pieces of the Belt and Road, you know, customs and you know, cross-border data flows and other things that were part of, of the infrastructure being built for digital, digital Silk Road. So the DSR, as originally thought of, was that. But then in some of the Chinese documents, you see them then referring to just about anything digital as as at least DSR. DSR. Right. But on the other hand, um, in the uh, chapter that I wrote, I talked to a lot of Chinese scholars. You know, there are institutes in China that study the the, the, the BRI, and they tend to do things like include uh, specifically things like telecom infrastructure, data centers, smart cities, and um, and things like uh, 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 um, what's what's the fifth one? The fourth one. Um, uh, so and, and, and so, so telecom, cloud, um, smart cities, and um, uh, and, and they and then they also exclude things like entertainment and TikTok, right? So is TikTok part of digital support? Probably not. Um, so they exclude entertainment. They exclude things like intelligent terminals, uh, because you do have a lot of companies like Transgen that's all over Africa or Oppo or Vivo or even Huawei. Um, and so are they part of the digital Silk Road? Well, maybe or maybe not. And then the other thing is payments like Alipay and Union Pay. Are they part of the digital Silk Road? <laughs> Chinese scholars don't include those, right. those, those, they, they have in, in, in the paper, I have a chart which shows how the Chinese scholars view what is and isn't part of digital Silk Road. So I think that's an important perspective here. But the problem is that um, it's the, 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 it's this umbrella term and sort of a branding term that that some companies refer to. The companies I talked to for the paper told me flat out that nobody in their C-suite ever mentioned the term digital Silk Road, right? <laughs> big, big players, right? So, and then I'm working with a couple of clients now that are sort of in that space, um, doing things like smart cities or autonomous vehicles. And they also, I've never heard the word digital Silk Road mentioned, <laughs> right? So I think it's, a, that, that that's part of the complication is understanding, you know, how, the government views it, how um, how scholars are viewing it, how companies are viewing it, and then how Western scholars are viewing it. If you look right. at some of the databases created around digital Silk Road, they throw anything that's remotely digital into that into a database and say that's BRI or digital Silk Road, and I think that's probably not all that useful. Um, so it, that, that's again one of the things we we tried to tackle 
um, in the paper is that issue. I think I think one example that sort of crystallizes this is in Thailand, where you have this Eastern Economic Corridor, where Huawei is building some of the telecom infrastructure, Alibaba through the, the electronic world trade platform is in there, because they don't, because Chinese scholars don't include e-commerce in DSR either, right? But but if you look at what's happening in Thailand, the infrastructure is being built by Chinese companies and, and they're doing logistics. So Alibaba has its logistics arm, Sinyao, doing logistics there. And it's making it easy for Chinese, Chinese customers to buy stuff or Thai, Thai customers to buy stuff in China and ship it to Thailand, right? So all this kind of comes together. There are bonded warehouses there that are that are going to be automated in this digital hub in Thailand. So there is that part of is that part of the digital Silk Road? Um, I would I would argue that it probably should be considered that because it is a, it comes with a lot of infrastructure and it's enabling a lot of things and then there's a regulatory piece to that too which we also get at in in, in the in the in the book and the papers which is where Chinese companies are playing major roles in in data and cloud and other areas that comes with some influence on the regulatory structure in those countries uh, particularly in places like Southeast Asia. Um, and so that has to also be considered. But was that originally part of Digital Silk Road thinking, you know, if, imp, uh, influencing regulatory structures in countries where Chinese companies are operating? Probably not, right? So it's an evolving concept. And your question, I think we didn't answer it in one sentence, but, you know, it's because it, 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 it's, it's definitely, I would just say it's a brand. It's a brand. Uh, I'm going to add something to that very last sentence that um, that Paul ended on, uh, and that is that, yes, it's a brand, yes, it's nebulous, and it's always going to be changing. So whereas for the BRI, and maybe can quickly touch on the differences between BRI and DSR, as was already mentioned, the stakeholders on the Chinese side are completely different. Uh, they're private sector rather than predominantly public sector or state owned. In terms of financing, a lot of this is commercial and not just based on state loans, though there are for some big infrastructure projects, projects that are um, are, are based on commercial loans and uh, loans by state owned policy banks in China. Um, and lastly, this is something not that this is not a, an initiative like the Belt and Road Initiative that recipient countries sign on to. This is almost something that countries become part of because there's a commercial interaction and relationship between China and a recipient country. So unlike the Belt and Road Initiative where every member state signs an MOU with the Chinese government to say we are now a BRI member state, that's not the case for the digital soil growth. So when you're trying to map this, and the IISS has mapped this um, uh, as part of a database called China Connects, which hopefully is not one of the useless or less useful uh, databases that Paul mentioned. Um, what we did to define this is to look at Chinese policy documents that do mention and briefly, uh, if not comprehensively, uh, talk about the technologies within uh, the Belt and Road and uh, the Digital Silk Road and how the Chinese government perceives those. And we see that there are about 13 different categories from the physical infrastructure level to the platforms and services level. And they do include from Chinese government perspectives, things like e-commerce and e-payment systems, which facilitate that digital commercial relationship that goes along with the Belt and Road Initiative um, that uh, the Chinese government is also leading on. So um, to say you know, that, that we can't define this is I, I think a little bit um, of, a, of a misnomer. We can put some form and shape to this, whilst understanding that this is always going to be a moving target, some categories are going to receive more attention over years, other less. Um, and just to give you an example, in recent years post-pandemic, e-health has become a, a focus of uh, digital Silk Road related uh, 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 discussions in the Chinese government as well. And I would just quickly add, that's great, that, that part of the challenge is when Chinese delegations go to countries, they, they bring like team China, right? Yeah. And so that yes. can include, and you know, we talk to companies that are concerned about that, right? Because they bring a lot of advantages there. And those those team China includes, you know, a lot of the players we're talking about that cut across both sort of traditional BRI um, projects and infrastructure and digital and other yeah. other areas. So so that makes it even so trickier to say what is digital silk road here and what is BRI. Yeah. Just quickly, add to all of your point, I first time I heard about the term DSR was in English, not in Mandarin. So <laughs> if that speaks to anything. Um, I think I see a hand, a couple hands. I think Stanley first, and then we'll go on the other side. Thank <laughs> you. 
Are you referring to Beidou? Yes. Yes. Um, I, I think he's thinking of Starlink as, as Starlink. sort of stealing a march on the land-based infrastructure. I, I think that's where he is. So let me make a comment here. So I think Stanley's comment is a good one in that. And if you look at the Belt and Road Initiative more generally, I think we're we're entering into a phase where, where the defining characteristic of the phase will be about debt and debt repayment and the relationship between uh, uh, Chinese debt and other forms of debt that that countries have. So I think the the broader theme here, uh, I think, is the the growing significance of debt in BRI and DSR uh, uh, themselves, but. The, the other elements of the question about the companies right. and all this, I think, right. really interesting. I, and so, I hope to hear. I mean, I can comments. try yeah. the beginning of an answer anyway um, to the question. So uh, it really depends on on the markets, you know, whether whether there's a likelihood of, of DSR um, projects making making money. Um, so, uh, you know, the DSR projects in um, uh, North America, Canada, now Western Europe, um, Japan, Taiwan, Korea uh, don't don't really exist. You know, I mean the the part of what I talk about in my chapter is I sort of divide up the world. So so in terms of those markets, initially the U.S., uh, East Asia, and Five Eyes basically um, leaving Britain out for the moment. Uh, you know, decided relatively early on that they didn't want to have Chinese technology in their networks because they thought it would represent a security threat. So they were kind of in, in the lead on that. Um, and eventually they brought they brought the Brits and, and, and what we used to call Western Europe into it. Those those areas, particularly Western Europe, were more interested in, in, in having Huawei kit, having ZTE and having these kinds of DSR, as it were, companies investing. Um, uh, for a variety of reasons, the the first one always being that they were less expensive, um, and the second one being that they weren't American. And so, um, a, a big theme in my chapter, and I think throughout the book, is is that the um, the desire of non-American countries not to be dependent on Silicon Valley companies for their conceivable technological and therefore economic future is a major factor in the decision. So. So for the rich countries, they kind of divide it into two, and basically they're kind of more or less one now. So uh, speaking very roughly in Latin America and Africa, um, you know, Western tech companies, whether it's Nokia or anybody really, um, didn't want to build infrastructure in those areas because they couldn't make enough money at it, or at least they didn't think they could. So in a sense that your question was answered for that. Chinese companies did think they could make money, or at least they thought they could make money given the amount of state sub subsidy that was given in order to build the infrastructure in the first place. So deciding whether in the end that was profitable or not is a little tricky, but they continue to do it. It had other sort of ancillary benefits. I mean, you had essentially provincial companies, you know, for a, com for a, a, a captive market of 1.4 billion, um, it's different to serve that market than to actually be a multinational. So, so that kind of expansion in Africa and Latin America, even if it maybe wasn't super profitable, had other benefits. You could become a multinational company and gain that kind of management experience. So, so in those areas, and they continue to dominate those areas, and a really interesting policy question in the U.S. is whether there, you know, it goes against the grain, but whether it's worth sort of essentially subsidizing Western technology in order to, you know, level the playing field, as it were, with, um, with, with Chinese companies. Southeast Asia is a, and, and India are very interesting because in those markets, they were inherently, especially in Southeast Asia, more lucrative markets. They were also already a lot of competition from Western uh, and East Asian companies, Japanese, Taiwanese, Korean companies in Southeast Asia because there was more money to be made in Southeast Asia and also in India. So in those markets, you know, there is going to be made Western companies make money, their Chinese companies make money, they're laying out infrastructure and then providing over the top services 
um, uh, on the infrastructure that they've helped build. So yeah, there's definitely money in it, but it's but it's for Chinese companies. But it depends on which part of the world you're looking at. Right, and particularly like like in uh, in Southeast Asia, you know, Alibaba is building data centers, you know, and, and including in other areas, but even in the UK, and uh, Huawei is building data centers and just opened one, which is building a big hub in Turkey, which um, is is interesting. Uh, and so they they they're competing, they're competing with Google and and AWS and Microsoft. Uh, which I think hold something like seventy percent of the cloud market in Southeast Asia, um, but they see a, a lucrative market there because they and they have advantages where, for example, in this Thai case I mentioned, you know they they have Alibaba brings both e-commerce and and data center expertise, uh, and so they're seeing um, those economies, particularly places like Thailand, as 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 highly profitable, and they they want to compete in part because in China the cloud market is sort of. Uh, is is a little bit saturated and it's not growing as fast and so they would like to um, expand their horizons. Um, uh, I think Alibaba just built up their third data center in, in, in places like Indonesia. So they they clearly see those markets as lucrative uh, for cloud services and they come in typically when you talk to U.S. companies they'll come in at half the price, right? Um, and it depends on what the service offering is because cloud is not really, you know, sort of fungible one-on-one, -on -one. Um, but but they certainly are are able to under underprice Western competitors to try to gain market share in those in those areas. And they certainly uh, are, are competitive and, and see those as lucrative. I, I wanna add one quick point to that, which is with, just since you mentioned Alibaba, mm -hmm. AliExpress is also super interesting because what and 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 you mentioned their their sort of business uh, what what are they called the business platforms or the trade platforms that Alibaba works on you mentioned them earlier anyway oh the, the electronic world trade platform yes yeah yeah, yeah, BW, yeah. BW, yeah. that's Jack Ma's yeah. vision of you know right yeah. but uh, transport and logistics mm -hmm. is a huge part of of the Ali company's you know mm -hmm. future plans and also China's official understanding of you know where they want to be in five or ten years in terms of these both domestically uh, for their domestic market and internationally so transport and logistics is a is a hugely important um, uh, part of the overall plan uh, and part of profitability as well right and i think alibaba has that secret the secret sauce yeah. which is yeah. China. Yeah. and i think that's something that i would have focused more on in, in, in hindsight in the Sequel. chapter Sequel. which is really <laughs> an, an important, you know a huge underrepresented player but i think in that Thai example it's all about logistics and, and the thai government sees that as part of its you know industry 4.0 and wants to be a big logistics hub and so trying the chinese companies are going to play a big role in that in in thinking about the the sort of larger geoeconomic geoeconomic impact of this and uh the the geo in the geoeconomics here i i think that 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 um the the centrality of southeast asia can't be overstated that 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 this is really uh this is really the the key area both i think in terms of of uh commercial competition making money and geoeconomic and geopolitical competition. And that's why it had sort of pride of place in the book. Uh, I think reflects that that centrality. And, and it's not to say it's the only area, but but uh Southeast Asia is the place where 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 this is playing out in in a way that's likely to have both the most commercial impact in the most geoeconomic and geopolitical yeah these are rich countries right where exactly <laughs> big markets big, big markets right big and india i mean they well, of the two yes, of them yeah. together in a way although they're but very quite but distinct india in india's heading into the group right. Uh, right i think that 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 southeast asia is still and how India plays it is going to be very important. So I'd like to ask two follow-up questions, particularly focused on Southeast Asia, right? Um, so I think there seems to be a divide between the so-called wealthier Southeast Asian countries versus the less developed continental, continental Southeast Asia. Um, what are the differences uh, between trans activities in the context of DSR in, in, in these two sort of two different categories of countries there. And, and secondly, um, there is a theme in the book that Chinese companies, tech companies seems to be more willing than Western competitors in terms of acquiring local stakes, in terms of localizing 
its business model in Southeast Asia. Uh, could you, could you guys maybe comment a little bit more on that? So I guess two two parts uh, two parts questions. Oh, is that me? <laughs> okay. Um, so I mean, the simplest way to think about it is that the poorer countries have fewer choices, and the richer countries right. have more. Right. So so you know, um, Laos or Cambodia have fewer choices than. Malaysia or Singapore. And the countries that have more choices tend to, um, you know, basically play the different players, or you'd say play them off each other or or, or present a wealth of opportunities to them. Um, uh, so I mean that's the way I, you know, that's the way I would I would describe it. What was the second question? Uh, local acquisition buying. Uh, right, 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 right. Well, know. that's a I mean, depending on where you're looking, but but for sure in Southeast Asia, it's it was um uh, and to a degree in Latin America, not really in Africa, uh, uh, and definitely in India, you know, the the at least the American companies, um, you know, really went to school on what the Chinese companies were doing, let's say maybe six, five years ago, because you're right, the, the chi Chinese companies, you know, um, uh, uh, rather undermining the stereotype of them as being sort of massive mindless drones of the CCP, um, you know, really try to work with, um, take equity stakes in local companies, very much adapt to local conditions. And that was a thing going back even into the late 90s that you would see with Huawei and its expansion. It was it was just very, it, it's tried to take into account local circumstances and, you know, not apply a one size fits all model and so on. So, so but American companies, I think, as far as I could tell, probably the biggest, as it were, wake up call was was India because because Chinese companies were getting so much investment going in India, and um, U.S. companies realized that they were they were really losing. Um, so it happened that there was a border incident. It happened that the government of India reacted in a way that redounded to the benefit of Western companies, and so they kind of realized we really need to invest locally um, rather than try to make everyone you know adopt Facebook, for example. Thank you. Can I maybe just add on that first question um, and, and just adding on to Scott's um, very succinct answer, just in terms of the two different Southeast Asia's, I, I agree that there's a, a, a disconnect here on socioeconomic and developmental terms, whereas the poorer, more landlocked countries are still very much in need of that hard physical infrastructure rollout that um, Chinese companies can offer at a competitive price, um, whereas the wealthier countries are ones that are now really targets for Chinese platform and services companies that are building on top of that existing digital infrastructure. I think an interesting um, uh, country and case study here that we've looked at is also Indonesia where you have um, kind of a combination of both of those two worlds. You have a highly connected, highly young, um, tech savvy, internet savvy um, uh, population that is already connected um, in larger cities, but it's a large archipelago that still also requires that additional physical infrastructure to you know, bring the two halves of Indonesia together almost. So that's an area uh, of key interest for um, Chinese companies moving forward. I'd also say that if you're looking at these two different groupings, countries that are landlocked tend to, um, well, countries like Cambodia and, and Laos are politically more aligned with uh, China if you look at um, Southeast Asia as a whole, whereas countries like um, Singapore, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia are, are the ones where you see a, a geopolitical tension in terms of not wanting to choose one way or the other between um, Chinese or, or U.S. technology and, and really to uh, push back on this notion of a bifurcated tech uh, world. So in that sense, you have um, both opportunity uh, to choose, but also a willingness not to choose uh, from those countries that I think is an interesting dynamic. Thank you. And I would just quickly add, we haven't even talked about uh, like autos and, and, EV, and EV batteries, and that's an area I think that's that's going to be huge. I was just consulting chat GPT on that. You know, <laughs> but, um, you know, that's a huge area, right? Because China, that's it's sort of a, an area that's, where Chinese companies dominate the sector, it's a little bit different than some of these other sectors yes. where 15 of the top 20 battery companies right. are, um, uh, are Chinese, China, China based. And so that's where I think it'll be interesting to see how that piece, we probably should have had a section called the green, you know, Silk Road um, is, gonna, is gonna play out because they're, those Chinese companies, particularly on EVs are very competitive. And then in the EV battery space, you know, the, the CATL, yeah. for example, is a, is a global, leader and they're they're building facility oh. building factories all over the place um and they and the, the dominant supply chains is, is really 
across the board for particularly for inputs is substantial. We're dealing with clients that want to do JVs in the US, for example, in that EV battery supply chain space, where the Chinese company that they want to partner with owns has the IP, the critical IP to develop a particular piece of the EV battery supply chain. And they, the, 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 our, our client says that the Chinese company is 10 years ahead of, of, of yeah. Western companies on this. So there's no alternative. So in, in, as we go forward, we're going to see more Chinese exports of cars and of, of batteries. And that ecosystem is going to be, I think, a really interesting part of this whole uh, uh, issue because those com those cars are also going to be autonomous vehicles right. which are going to require infrastructure to support them in terms of data centers etc and that's something we you know maybe the and sequel, satellites too and and, and, and <laughs> then there's a satellite segment right so that's a great i would answer. can i just add to that one thing on the green uh, the green thing just the 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 degree to which chinese companies are out front on on battery recycling is 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 profound and 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 the you know Environmental issues really are strategic issues from a Chinese point of view. I mean, they're not always declared that way, but they but they function that way. And it's it's always really important to look at look at that. And and Chinese companies know that, and they they develop products in in order to 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 feed that 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 strategic need. I think it's quite interesting that what China now has pouring a lot of money into semiconductor batteries and all that. It's directly related to what the country can't do, right? Semiconductor. It, it, it has this vulnerability at the most advanced level. And China, uh, China has never been able to produce the high-end engine uh, right. historically. So uh, it's quite interesting how, how battery industry is, is advancing in that regard. And please. So thanks. So, oh, That seems like a poll question. It does? Yeah, yeah. it's a poll question. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I guess, it, again, that you have to look at it, and I think we do in the book, across the technology stack, right? So um, uh, I think somebody said earlier, you know, a large part of China's technology stack is built on Western technology, particularly things like semiconductors. But um, companies like Huawei, for example, in the 5G space um, ha have have huge patent portfolios and have you know and, and own a lot of intellectual property in the 5G infrastructure space and and handset space. So uh, as do other Chinese companies that play in that uh, that arena. Um, and then on the on the payment side, of course, uh, if you look at the farther up the, the the stack, yes, Chinese companies like like Ant and Alibaba and and and, and Tencent. Th these are very innovative companies that are bringing their payment systems or their logistic systems, in the case of Alibaba, to to these to these projects. Um, and so I think you know it's a it's it, the 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 it, it's an interesting problem that. China faces, which is that the sort of lower end of the stack, particularly the, on the semiconductor side, are they are very dependent on um, on Western technology for certain key pieces of that, and and that's that's of course where the U.S. has weaponized supply chains to 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 to, to target things things like AI and and machine learning and high performance computing, um, and so that's going to be a problem going forward because um, some of these companies that are pushing into things like cloud services, for example, Alibaba. Huawei will at some point won't be able to get access to you know Nvidia A100 uh, GPUs, which are really critical, uh, for example, to run AI workloads in the cloud, and also for things like virtualization um, to reduce power consumption. And so uh, eventually, um, that's going to probably be an issue with um, with their some of their projects overseas if they if that if they can't find workarounds to that. So one of the challenges there that, that, that the Beijing faces is, is how to restructure their industrial policies around semiconductors to try to work around some of these problems and that's that's a big challenge so is the is the major chinese 
contribution on the technology side in the business processing technologies or in the technologies inherent to the products themselves? In EVs, it's the latter. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of genuine innovation being right. done by Chinese companies right. in right. the EV supply chain, right. for sure, especially around batteries, but in other parts, too. Please. Uh, Sean Kanaka, thank you, everyone. Uh, really enjoying your comments, but I would welcome from any or all the panelists, in your opinion, what's the strategic so what here from the DSR? I'm not a sinologist. Is this a story of global market competition? Is it a story of technological surveillance and oppression? Is it soft power? What should my takeaway from this panel be? That's great. So, so, so let me give uh, a, a very partial answer to this on the the on the sort of geoeconomic side of it, emphasizing the geo here. I think w one of the key t takeaways is that the most important region is Southeast Asia. That 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 if you're looking at a a political competition uh and in particular it, it that that the that the the competitiveness piece of it is in the wealthier archipelago countries rather than the the poorer mainland countries i think the poorer mainland countries are becoming increasingly dominated and by and f focused on china but they they don't have a huge impact your your you know laos cambodia etc that that it's it's malaysia it's indonesia it's those countries it seems to me that 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 are are the key competitive focal point here but but that but the geo is just one piece of it i think the the there's a whole other area of competitiveness and geopolitics in the in, in the technological niches yeah, I, I would just step back and say I think it's it's part of Sean of um, it's now become part of the broader U.S. China, China. tech competition, right? right? Which Secretary Blinken outlined in May, and and uh, National Security Advisor Sullivan, you know, mentioned specifically compute, biotech, and green tech as strategic force multipliers that are of national security concern. So guess what? That's that's you know the DSR for good or for bad is part of that, and so I think the way to view it is that. You know, it, it, from a Chinese point of view, I think Xi Jinping, when he came and and sort of, you know, went, went with Belt and Road, and and, it, and and particularly in the digital realm, the goal was for Chinese companies and Chinese, uh, the, the Chinese, uh, particularly companies, to play a role in building the next generation architecture, digital architecture. So, in part, so they had a say in the rules around that, for example, and and setting regulatory rules and 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 rules of the game. And so, so I think the DSR is. It's, it wasn't necessarily a, a Chinese government initiative in the way BRI was, but I think it's become now a, it's for, because because some, these Chinese companies have been so successful, arguably building and, and pro providing an alternative to Western technology companies, you know, whether it's 5G infrastructure or, and 6G infrastructure or cloud services, for example, that for, for, for good or for worse, the, the, that, that piece of DSR now is an important geopolitical asset for China, um, yeah. which as we get into this, heavy tech competition will be important in those areas I mentioned in particularly in Latin America, Africa and and, the, and Southeast Asia where there's sort of contention for dominance in the technology stack between US companies and, and Western companies and US companies. And so that the DSR needs to be understood in that context going forward because we are as part of this of this sort of um this intense competition that Secretary Blinken mentioned. And it's the it's the part interestingly that's not directly US China. It's the it's the rest of the world. Right. Right. So moving Which on has to, to two sides or not. Moving on to the next part of our discussion. Um one of the major themes, especially in, in Paul's chapter, I think, is, is that 
as, as we already mentioned a little bit, uh, is that the DSR, DSR being a branding effort by the private companies and, and tech com companies in China. Uh, now, as Beijing has, uh, you know, uh, embarked on this regulatory tightening in the past few years, uh, taking on perhaps a, a more interventionist role uh, in the management of the private sector, is it realistic for Beijing to, to play a more expensive role in the DSR, given the geopolitical tension, given uh, activism of the private sector? How do you see the competing interests play out? Well, I think the Question. Then you have to you have to understand what the, the tech crackdown or, or rectification campaign was primarily driven by a couple of a couple of, of issues. One was Beijing felt that all this energy was going into things like e-commerce and gaming and online education that wasn't productive uh, and wasn't helping them with hard and core technologies like semiconductors. So that was a big driver. And then um, I think you know the 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 the, the crackdown also sort of has has now played out, but it hasn't really impacted those companies in sectors that we're talking about here, like in cloud and infrastructure, because it wasn't that wasn't really the target of that. So we've seen, you know, it hasn't really impacted Alibaba is still investing in data centers in Southeast Asia, right? There's it hasn't impacted their global mm. strategy as much because it really was di directed more at, at things like content. Mm. Um, and those they, you know, the, the government has taken, for example, these one percent golden shares to companies, but that's really about content. It's not about it's not a, it's a content part of ByteDance and Alibaba, it's not the infrastructure and AI and other parts of the company, uh, for example. And so um, I, I don't know that the tech crackdown, you know, it was part of the, the pandemic and and the sort of last two or three years where where the Chinese tech sector was 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 pretty big, pretty impacted pretty, in a pretty big way. And it certainly affected the revenue of those companies within China. And so it probably had some impact on their ability to expand globally. But now I think the, the, the regulatory structure has said, okay, we, we sort of put in place these controls and we we, we now have reined in some of the, the worst aspects of the of, of the sector. Um, and uh, and now we're we're ready to to roll out again. I think we'll see. Mm -hmm. Part of the, the the pivot, which you know, which she's coming out of the G20 and Xi Jinping is you know pivoting on very much on the economy, foreign policy, and 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 um and and social policy around COVID, but not so much on security policy, but but mm -hmm. certainly I think that we'll see a lot more. Um, support for Chinese companies to, you know, expand globally, and in, as we get into this more intense competition um, with the U.S. Right. So, can I I'm just sorry. jump in there really quickly? Please, just, um, just to make one point to follow on from that. So, I agree that um, the tech crackdown um, or uh, the the focus of the government over the past few years on China's private sector uh, tech companies hasn't necessarily changed their um, their their participation in the digital Silk Road. Rather, I think it's the U.S.'s export controls that have um, uh, really thrown a, 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 a have have made this more complicated moving forward um, for reasons that we've already discussed. But what I think has been done by this focus by the government on Chinese private tech companies and the intervention uh, interventionist approach here is bringing further uh, into light in the minds of Western critics of Chinese tech companies the uh, the argument that there is an even greater linkage between Chinese private tech companies and um, the Chinese government and the CCP. Right. So in that sense, I think that's made at least for Chinese tech companies wishing to operate in the West, the picture even more difficult moving forward. Right. Yeah, I, so I think that's right. I think the Chinese tech companies, particularly those wanting who, with Western aspirations, they're, they're, they're caught in a double bind in, in that in the West, they're they're seen as stalking horses for the Chinese government, but the Chinese government looks warily at them, doesn't necessarily feel that it has the the level of influence on them and over them sufficient to meet Chinese national goals as opposed to the commercial goals of the company so it's a yeah. it's a really it's quite interesting to me i think that that the that that china i think continues to 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 have some fears around tech companies gaining too much power tech companies 
becoming instruments of the creation of, of more autonomous spaces right. in China that, that the CCP doesn't dominate. Uh, and I think that's going to be, I agree, great comments. I think that's, that'll be the key to watch as this sort of opening and this, this, this pivot and, and more welcoming of foreign investment. The key is those Chinese global companies and how they're, how they, if they can distance themselves from the government, because they all want to be, they want to be global players and they, they complain internally. I've talked to many of them right. and they're very critical of the Chinese government policies on, on this, right? They, they, they want to, if Alibaba wants to operate in in, in Europe, right. wouldn't it be nice if China was GDPR compliant, right? But that's never going to happen. Um, and so companies that are that, that have many companies have global aspirations, um, they're really in this sort of two way political risk, which is, you know, the, the US is, is coming down on, on, on key areas like and this year will probably be data and AI and, uh, and other things. Um, and so companies operating in those spaces that have that want to play in across markets are really in a tough position because they're sort of stuck with being, you know, with the national intelligence law saying that every company has to turn over all the data, right? And that's so actually TikTok is a good is an interesting case in point here. Um, I got a two hour briefing from their CEO last week on what they're doing to 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 um, to um, to eventually comply with the national security agreement if we get to one and they they basically spent 1.5 billion dollars re-architecting their u.s um system to, to make sure that, that the data user data is protected by the way in a way that no other social media company does um and they've hired a lot of auditors and they're already this week auditing the source code for example and so that's an example of a chinese company that wants to go global yeah. and is willing to spend the money mm -hmm. to try to address they decided to to not contest U.S. national security concerns, mm -hmm. they said we're going to make we're going to protect privacy, data privacy, and, and we're going to protect content mm -hmm. on the on the platform. And they've actually, you know, put, they've successfully done it. But there's still a lot of doubt whether that security agreement. Which forward. brings to a question that I really want to ask for, <laughs> for today's event: Are we seeing, or will we see, a a sort of voluntary decentification of China's own tech companies, given the regulatory? concerns at home given the cost of doing business i guess regulatory concerns both at home and and in, in the western world to make it less chinese to to expand earlier at a life cycle of their company well that's a good question it depends on the company and how it's structured for example if it's a cayman islands vie then it's really tough <laughs> right if it's a company that bought a u.s part of a US company and is trying to, and it's a little bit under the radar on some of these tech competition issues. There are examples of those, some of which may or may not be clients. Um, so it really depends on the sector because some some Chinese companies can't do that. I think the AI companies are a good example where you know they were all founded by these very young entrepreneurs and very, who all wanted to go global. And then they were hit with you know US export controls. And now they're sort of, they're in a tough situation. They can't really do that. They can't sort of, uh, you know, de, uh, you know, de -scenify. De -scenify. So I think it very much depends on the sector and the company and the business and how how central it is to U.S. China tech competition. Um, but you know, companies like CTL, they're not they're succeeding globally, and they're they have no interest in you know they're based in in Ningbo, right? And they're 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 very proud of that, right? Or Ningda, no, it's Ningda. Ningda. Right? Um, sorry. And you know they're 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 a good example of a sort of a new type of Chinese company, which is unabashedly global, but is very you know they're all they're they're art they're they're R and D and everything is done in China, and you know they have they're they're succeeding. So. Please, Mike Bennett, Director of National Intelligence. So I've spent the better part of the last 10 years as a senior defense official and chief of security cooperation in uh, the Western Hemisphere. There is no doubt we are being outcompeted with the building of infrastructure by China. And what can the U.S. first, I'd like to point out, I don't have TikTok on my government phone. Um, <laughs> second, what can we do to incentivize U.S. and Western companies to compete for these contracts to build this digital infrastructure that will help these developing countries and catapult them into a modern uh marketplace right so it's not just about market competition it's about strategic competition and the security threat posed by huawei and the back doors huawei gives to the state government and we need to and not enable that right we need to compete against that and use u.s technology what can we do to incentivize several administrations have talked about this problem none have offered packages to incentivize u.s and western companies to build in these areas what needs to be done to do that it's an investment 
China outcompetes us. Well, there's no U.S. competitor to Huawei. That's part of the problem. Cisco, right. Motorola. Not, not really. Not really, but, but then, I mean, yeah. you know, there's. It's a great question. That's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I think specifically on, on on mobile infrastructure, that's a tricky one. So the, yeah. the policy has been to, as I think Scott mentioned, to um, push things like the clean network and 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 sort of incentivize incentivize, although arguably. The problem is there hasn't been enough incentivizing of Western carriers to, to rip Huawei out of their networks because that's very costly. And so that's why Germany still has, you know, 80 percent of its networks still Huawei. The problem is there aren't there aren't U.S. competitors to that. And things like ORAN, for example, Open Radio Access Network is still not is still not ready for prime time. Right. It's, it's the U.S. government, I think, you know, sort of jumped the gun a little bit and put a lot of effort into that. And there's money for ORAN, R&D and other things. But that's a that's a complicated situation where. Guess what? A lot of the a lot of the standards around ORAN are include the ORAN alliance includes lots of Chinese companies, including some on the entity list, by the way. Um, and so it's not clear that Open RAN and and that is going to be an alternative. There are many U.S. companies participating in that, and including the big cloud players. Microsoft has a five G strategy, but it's not clear what will coalesce there as a as a clear competitor to integrated players like Ericsson and Nokia, um, which are still very great companies and are, are, but the question is, can they, can they wire the world with 5G that have enough capacity um, if you take Huawei and ZTE out of the equation? So anyway, that, that's a complicated issue. And there's no, um, I don't see any US, you know, Motorola for complicated reasons is not, a, no longer a player, um, but there's no US competitor to that. And so the US has put a lot of effort into ORAN. And I'm just not, it's not clear that that's going to result in a, in a more competitive market and, and be able to replace Huawei and CTE for carriers that want diversity, for example, in, in these markets. Um, can I just, uh, so, so I think in the, in the, in the short term, so the U.S. Um, and, and American tech companies, as, as Paul just illustrated, um, you know, the U.S. government from time to time will say, well, isn't it, you know, isn't it sad that Latin America was entirely wired up by compromised Chinese, you know, infrastructure companies? Um, uh, and yeah, it's sad, but but there were no American or other companies that were going to do it. And, and as Paul said, in some cases, the, the alternative companies didn't actually um, exist, you know. So so um, I'm, I'm not sure that the Policy wise, there's really, you know, frankly, too much of an option there. Um, uh, what I would look at rather is the degree to which local um, uh, telecoms companies and other infrastructure developers, you know, um, are able to sort of fill that breach because the US is never going to subsidize massive multinational companies. That will essentially be an American Huawei. I just don't. I just think it's hopeless to to hold that out as an option. But um, in Africa, for example, you know, there's there's a group um, uh, the WIOCC, the West Indian Ocean Cable Company. Um, it's a consortium of fourteen different, uh, yeah. basically infrastructure African in infrastructure companies. Um, it includes World <laughs> the World Bank's IFC. Um, it includes, uh, uh, it, it, it is in partnership often with the ACA, which is, I forget what that stands for, but it's an African um, uh, private equity company, um, uh, sort of a consortium as well. So just to take the African example, you know, if, if Western policy or American policy were to enter the market at that point, where it's, um, it's encouraging local uh, local alternatives, as it were, to parts of what Huawei or ZTE might do, then over time, that would both be relatively consistent with the US's approach um, to this kind of development investment, um, but would also be developing alternatives to Chinese companies that aren't American alternatives. And, um, and, and I think that would be a useful orientation of policy, at least in, in some markets, you know, but particularly in Africa. To a degree in Latin in Latin America, um, maybe in some future in Central Asia, some different so, future. So let me push you a little bit on that. I think the key here is what's the content of encourage. Right. Well. Okay. Fair enough. So 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 in the like like the groups I was just talking about. Right. So they're involved in 
the two Africa um, right. uh, cable yeah. project. Yeah. Okay, so that's maybe that's a good example. So 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 two two Africa is currently being built. It, it 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 will when it's done. It will. It's not only. I think it's already the largest single um, underwater fiber optic cable project in the world. And when it's completed, it will um, it will exceed the current cable capacity of all earlier projects in Africa. So it's a very very big project. Um, the 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 main players involved in that are uh, uh, China Mobile. Um, the government of Egypt uh, through Egypt Sat, I forget the name of it. Um, the government of Saudi Arabia uh, through STC. Um, the groups I mentioned earlier, the African groups, MTN, which is basically a South African company, uh, Vodafone um, and Facebook. Facebook. So Facebook, famously an American company. So, um, and I mentioned the World Bank. So, so in that instance, you know what, what? What? What's the U.S. play there, right? Is it going to put pressure on Facebook to get out of any joint projects with China Mobile, which is an entirely Chinese government-controlled entity, um, or is it going to work through Facebook, American company, in order to, you know, affect and encourage the development of of infrastructure, digital infrastructure in Africa? I would speculate, but it's pure speculation. Maybe people in the audience know better than I do, but I would speculate that the reason that Facebook has not been pressured to come out of that project is because the US government rightly realizes that that would be absolutely awful in terms Cheating. of its political right. position Cheating in Africa. The, the position all to China. But yeah. the reality is that a major American company and a government controlled Chinese company yeah. are working together to yeah. build infrastructure in Africa, not just to build it, but the single most important project. So, and then, I mean, I won't go on and on about to Africa, but the other element there is the World Bank. So would the US, a powerful member of the World Bank, would it oppose the IFC helping finance this, this development project in African digital infrastructure, or would it encourage it? So, those, so in answer to the question, those are places where American policy can work, you know, constructively um, and ultimately, in a sense, to, you know, take some territory away, I suppose, from Huawei or ZTE. But again, the U.S. is not going to have a, a, a frontal confrontation and build up alternative multinationals. It's just not going to do it. Right. And I think it's a great, the, the whole, we didn't talk about the cable thing, but that's a huge issue, which is, in some cases, the U.S. government has, has, has not approved licenses for landing in places like Hong Kong. Um, and that's a real problem because some of those consortia, which is the way fiber optic cables get built, include U.S. companies, big U.S. players like Google, um, and they take a long time to, to put together and finance. Um, and China is a huge, there, there's lots of people that will pay for those services in China. And so if you take, if you don't allow that, the argument is that that uh, that those cables will get built by somebody, right. and then the, the sort of centrality in, of the internet, the, the U.S. sort of centric right. centrality of the internet will be eroded because you're going to have projects built without U.S. players in them, uh, mm -hmm. and they won't have as much connectivity to the U.S. So there's an argument sort of for being careful about um, how, for example, you license you, you issue licenses for cable landings in China or or Hong Kong. I think right. the, a major theme in Scott's chapter is that the more advanced the technology and therefore uh, greater computing capacity, the more vulnerable the technology may be to government control and data localization rules. I think we're, we're already seeing that to some extent in China, in Southeast Asia, in EU's GDPR, uh, to an extent there's a patchwork of different rules on, on, on cross-border data flows. But on the other hand, there's also you know, RCEP, IPAV, CPTPP, that to some extent emphasize the free flow of data across borders. How do you guys see these two competing trends play out in the next, perhaps next five years? Uh, especially for Southeast, Southeast Asia, I guess, that it sits at the center of this patchwork of different rules. <laughs> you know, it's, it's an irresolvable yeah. Hegelian dialectic is how I see it. <laughs> but so but but this is so correct me scott because i think of of us up here you've looked at this the most carefully that 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 i don't see i don't see this being resolved in one direction or or the other that 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 it will continue to be china having a, a larger play, but the U.S. not 
wanting to walk away. Yeah, I mean the so I mean data localization. I mean what how he was referring to is, is, is I mean I just think that that train left the station. <laughs> frankly, I mean because 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 all of the different it's not as though the U.S. doesn't like data localization. It's certainly not as if the European Union doesn't like data localization. I mean everybody has their own reasons. You know whether it's to surveil your citizens or to protect their privacy. Technically, it kind of amounts to the same thing. Unfortunately, perhaps, but so. Um, uh, you know, data localization, the relationship between, you know, the latency of, of, of radio networks and basically that if you're going to have a mobile, you know, if you're going to have a mobile system, the, each, of this, each of the devices needs to com communicate back with some sort of faster and bigger computing power somewhere. And the closer that is geographically, the better the system works. So, so the mobile internet basically, you know, it creates, uh, uh, paradoxically perhaps, uh, a territorialization of the internet in order for it to overcome the latency problem. So, so, so for that, for political and technical reasons, the the localization thing um, seems inevitable. So, so the question then is, what do you do about cross cross border data flows? And 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 I just think it's kind of a brave new world, you know, but the 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 role of government in being able to sort of say what data can and can't be moved is yeah. is is not right. going to go away right. you know it's it's just right. yeah I, I really do i mean i was joking about hegel but i really do think it is right. an irresolvable kind of thing well just to give an example i mean china right now is is fine is implementing its cross-border data measures and so we have clients that are figuring out what their data is that's being transferred and how important it is because the Chinese have classified data into a number of categories. categories. Yeah. And so there's a self-assessment that companies are going through now yeah. in China to figure out what their data is. And the Chinese authorities don't really know what they're going to do here because they understand that you can't sort of prevent certain kinds of data from going across borders, you know, personnel data, HR data, for example. And so they're not saying no data can go. They're trying to get a handle on what data is, is going, right? And I agree with the data localization piece, um, but I think in Asia, generally people would prefer, for example, that both China and US be in something like CPTPP, which has very high bars around these things in which a lot of effort has gone into construct um, the data local, the data chapter of, of, of CPTPP, for example. Um, and so in the meantime, though, you do have all these other competing regional uh, arrangements because countries are sort of saying, hey, we need to have, it would be nice to have clearer rules in the digital space about these things like data localization and cross-border data flows. The interesting example is TikTok, which is, is being, if, they, if this agreement goes forward, they're localizing data in the US their big worry is all these TikTok users roaming globally and all that data will have to go back through the US and there'll, there'll be a big latency problem mm. and they'll be, they'll, that, that will impact their ability to deliver their, their uh, short videos uh, in, you know, with millimeter, with, you know, and, and, and really short millisecond delays. Um, and so that's an example of data localization where, where the US is preferring that uh, in this case. And, um, but it comes with a lot of, a lot of issues. What I worry about here is that the U.S. is not involved in the in the big efforts, particularly CPTPP. They've set up their own, but the, there won't be any there there. In, 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 you mean IPEF? Yes. Uh, so so it looks it looks more competitive than it's actually going to be. That 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 I don't see IPEF competing. With CPTPP, that 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 the that that the the Southeast Asians, the Asians generally are committed to CPTPP. IPEF, IPEF is is going to be an alternative, but it's not really real. Well, there's no, nothing binding. There's no binding parts of it. It's and it does. It's not really a trade. No, agreement, that's the right? point. A, yeah, there's no trade part of it. Trade, tradeless trade agreement. Yeah. So we have 10 more minutes left. Um, let's perhaps move on to the last part of our discussion on the geopolitics of which we've already been talking about uh, throughout. So I wonder what has been the role of Europe, Japan, uh, South Korea, and, and Taiwan in Washington's effort to push back against, uh, to thwart China's uh, technological ambition? Uh, is the export control effort getting more multilateral? Well, um, that's a great question. And we're sort of at a um, juncture here where we'll probably have an announcement next week about 
whether and how Japan or the Netherlands will align on the October 7th controls. And it's a very complicated issue. We have many clients in the middle of this in one way or another. Um, but basically, the end use controls that were included in those October 7th, uh, the October 7th package were, were not fully negotiated with those, those actors. Um, so there was a lot of surprise when they were dropped on October 7th. I call it the October 7th surprise. Um, so industry is still grappling with this. The Dutch government, of course, is, um, and companies like ASML, for example, um, are concerned about losing 50% uh, of their revenue uh, because the U.S. wants to control 25-year-old technology. So they're pushing back quite a bit on this, um, and as are the Japanese. Uh, and the Japanese are looking to the Dutch for leadership, and the Dutch are trying to get Germany involved um, to make it broader than just um, Germ to just the Netherlands and make it about EU technological, technological sovereignty, for example, um, because SML and, and other companies in their supply chain are so critical pieces of the, of the Europe, um, Europe's technology uh, sectors. Um, so I think there'll be some announcement in, in next week that will, will be sort of broad alignment, but the details, the devil is really in the details here um, as, as to how you treat things like US persons controls that were included there that that traditionally have been used sparingly in terms of weapons of mass destruction, but this package requires both Japan and the Netherlands to, to align with US concern about the national security implications of specific semiconductor nodes that are inherently not military in the way that the traditional things like in Vassenau or in other agreements were much closer to the military point of view. And so that's what they're having trouble with is you know, I'm going to cripple my industry and the national security gains here are not clear, as clear as they would be in case of, you know, right. closer to WMBs. Anyway, so, it's, it's a, so the, the media has been churning on this. Most of the stories like by, by Bloomberg are not accurate um, because the, it's going to take time to figure this out in, in some detail. And I think Gina Raimondo said in, in October, you know, six to nine months. Um, uh, and there have been very intense negotiations. Um, the, the Dutch uh, Prime Minister Rutte was here last year, last week, and they were talking about this. And so there's ongoing negotiations um, amongst the players, particularly the White House, uh, Commerce, and, uh, and, and the Dutch and Japanese governments. So, so I, was in, I, I was in Japan last week, and there's a lot of interest in this. The Japanese don't like it, but they don't want to, to be non-participatory. Right. So that, I mean, where that's going to lead them at the end of the day, I'm not even sure if they know yet, but, but um, they, they, they neither like it nor want to be left out. So, I mean, I do think that right. they end up coming in in some way. Uh, right. Well, the, the, the problem is that, that the U.S. toolmakers who are most affected by this, for example, um, are, are losing something like right. $5 billion this year, right? And so um, their argument is this has to apply to everybody or you know, right. the exactly. Japanese right. and the Dutch will go in and replace us in China. Right. Um, and so the by dropping these controls unilaterally, the, the US government has put itself in sort of an awkward situation with industry and with the Dutch and Japanese governments who didn't think that these controls were going to be placed where they were at 14 and 16 mm -hmm. nanometers. They thought it would be 10 nanometers. Um, and they could go along with that because that's advanced technology. Right. Um, that's what tax controls usually target. But 14 and 16 nanometers are considered mature. Uh, and that's and Chinese have that equipment already. And, and so that's the argument is that, that, that has to be overcome here. And so it's a, it's a trick issue. But the big losers so far are uh, uh, Applied Materials, KLA Tankor, and LAM Research, who went to GINA and said, we, we're losing $5 billion this year. And that will translate right away into headcount and layoffs. Um, and then that gets worse next year. By the way, in terms of uh, quantity, so it's a it's a it's a tough issue. Can I just add? Um, so I, I'm Dutch. I went have been to the Netherlands for the past few months to talk about these issues as well. I think generally speaking, there is uh, I think a context that needs to be kept in mind here as well in in European countries, which is a, a generally more critical view of China. And so there is yes, a disconnect between players like ASML um, on some of these very critical issues uh, and the Dutch government. But overall, I think as a um, as a, as a national policymaking ecosystem, mm -hmm. there's a general agreement that that transatlantic relationship needs to take priority over everything else. So I think from my perspective, um, there, there will be uh, some form of agreement and, and settlement on these issues that, that you just talked about in greater detail um, in the next few weeks. Uh, and it's not, 
I think in my mind, likely that the US, uh, the Netherlands won't um, participate in this um, to the extent that the US uh, would like. What I think is an interesting question that um, is being asked, uh, not just in the US, but also in, in countries like the Netherlands is, all right, if we're losing, uh, if companies like ASML, um, US companies, Japanese companies are losing revenue from as a result of these uh, export controls, where does money come from for reinvestment in innovation? Where does that come from, uh, either from the government or from the company side to ensure that um, you're not just maintaining a static um, uh, and ever growing uh, tech gap uh, and leadership over Chinese companies, but also that you're continuing to innovate as well uh, domestically. And so I think that's an answer where uh, governments like the Netherlands still need to come in with, with answers as well. And I suppose also governments like the US government yeah. as well. Correct. Correct. Yeah, yeah. That's a good, yeah. good, good point. Yeah. Um, it's a really, really good point. And it, and it, and it, Paul mentioned gaming earlier and the, and the, CCP's hostility to gaming, which is part of a whole domestic thing about how young men yeah. aren't what they used to be. <laughs> and um, but but it reminded me of the Soviet example because because you know gaming, if you just sort of look at it a bit in isolation, I mean, I, I think you could argue that the key to the development of artificial intelligence has been gaming. Certainly the key to the development of, of visual interfaces, sure. graphics and, and so on, pretty much entirely driven um, by the habits of young men and their willingness to spend money on it. So, so the, the metaphorically, it reminds me of the Soviet example, because if there were anything that the Soviets would have been against, it was young people enjoying themselves in the privacy of their own homes. And so, you know, you, you, the, the ways in which innovation happens to Maya's question, you know, in a free market economy where we don't police the behavior of young men, um, you know, you, you get certain kinds of innovation. And, and, and so, um, I mean, in terms of like, if we have a bifurcated tech globe, um, what happens then? Um, uh, it wouldn't necessarily restrict innovation um, because, you know, his, historically major states and, you know, pointing their economies towards competition that they wouldn't otherwise engage in because there's a political struggle has led to a lot of innovation. So it's not like innovation would end, um, but it would certainly take different forms. Um, uh, and, and I think one risk is that the competition will chi with China will lead American innovation towards you know, a sort of Soviet light situation where it's innovating in order to compete rather than generating innovation in the way that's tended to be more natural to mm. the US and other you know, major free market um, economies. But but if I can just make one other point because I, I keep thinking about Sean's question, the I do think something that that Western com countries and particularly the U.S. need to keep in the front of their minds, um, uh, and I think in the kind of rush to develop policies that sometimes gets forgotten. If the goal is to take a country that was very poor thirty to forty years ago, um, now have a very fragile middle class with a um, but has hit a demographic plateau, has more than had 1.4 billion people in it, and a really big military. Um, if the if if the goal is to bottle that country up, um, you know, let's let's think clearly about where that leads. And can I end by get back to the original question? I've asked ChatGPT how to define the digital Silk Road. So ChatGPT. The Digital Silk Road, also known as One Belt, One Road, okay, not so good, um, <laughs> is a Chinese government-led initiative to expand China's economic and technological influence through investments in digital infrastructure and technology in countries along the traditional Silk Road trade routes. This includes the building of telecommunications networks, the implementation of e-commerce platforms, and the establishment of technology parks and research centers. The goal of the initiative is to promote economic development and increase connectivity between China and particularly countries in Asia, Europe, and Africa. I'd give that a B minus. Okay, so it's, but that's that's um, that's how um, ChatGPT defines uh, DSR. But they're including trade, which they yeah, did. Which they yeah, were right about. They that. were right about that. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's better than a B minus. Yeah, maybe it might be. Yeah. Maybe. It's pretty good, actually. It's pretty good. Okay. What is the government? The government. <laughs>
It doesn't mention that in here. It says it, 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 it does say it does say it, it says a Chinese government led initiative. Does okay. it? Yeah, it does say that. Well, please join me. Join me to thank uh, panelists for some fantastic Thank you for joining us. Thank you.